about what you are doing. How did you come up to uh, take this uh, drastic decision to do an anger strike and to go every day in front of the White House supporting the people in Gaza and Palestine? So, um, and I know you were not the first one to do it. I mean, to do the anger strike, I think so. But before that, it was uh, Bushnell who has been who immolated himself in front of the Israeli embassy, mm -hmm. and was another uh, military personnel uh, in Atlanta before that, where we don't have the name. So, right. so now it's your turn. And I know you're carrying a sign every day uh, yeah. who say, uh, active duty airmen refuse to eat while Gaza starves. Okay, so um, to start, um... A little background, I guess. Uh, I've I've been keeping up since October with the events unfolding in Gaza, and um, been extremely difficult, obviously, to deal with uh, personally. I know for many people, it's been extremely difficult to just watch a a genocide happening. Um, I was originally going to just start a CO application, conscientious objector. Yeah, and. I was just going to get out, you know, the right way um, because I, I didn't want to continue service if my service was going to be, you know, harming civilians like that and killing them. So, um, yeah, that, that was the that was the reason for me wanting to get out. Um, and then what pretty much forced my hand to come to D.C., was in part Aaron Bushnell and his actions with his uh, self-immolation in front of the Israeli embassy. And then uh, additionally, it was the response from our leadership within the military and within the government, which was they were just silent about everything. Only a few days after Aaron Bushnell's death, um, I saw people in Yemen and in Gaza holding up his image. And I saw people, or, uh, Hamas issued an official, estate, uh, an official statement only two days after too. And, um, and that was really, that really like changed my perspective on the whole situation. Uh, if people in, in these countries that, you know, we, we don't consider allies and even uh, an organization like Hamas that the state um, considers a terrorist organization, yep. able to pay their respects to one of our own, and our and our leaders can't even do that. So, so you took the, as, at that time you were already doing the hunger strike, or you you started after receiving the support from a, a larger community. Oh, um, so I I came to DC about two and a half weeks ago now and i just met up with local groups here in dc to try to figure out um how i can best help yeah uh, from someone in my position and um you know i saw what code pink does which is that you know they go to congress um yeah. every day and do local yeah. events yeah and i felt like that was effective but it may not be effective for someone in my position and the the worsening starvation happening and being enforced on gaza by israel um i felt like i just i just naturally came up with the idea for a hunger strike and then so now i, I don't know do you have a plan how do you see how it is going do you get do you get people uh, supporting you on day to day do you your health is, is not an issue. I mean, how do you see the the, the continuation? Right. Um, yeah, on, on my day-to-day, -day, I get 99% support. Wow. <laughs> and just like a couple, like yesterday, I didn't receive any um, no? issue whatsoever. There no. was a group that harassed uh, a vigil that was going on. Besides that, no. There's been uh, just a couple here and there, and I did have a really productive conversation with someone who was aggressive at first, uh, but then ended up having a, a nice conversation with, and uh, it, it turned out to be a member of the State Department. So, so you get 99% of people on the street supporting you. 
in in the U.S. in Washington D.C. Yeah, you have to understand that he's on the public side of the White House fence. If he was on the other side of the White House fence, it wouldn't be that good. No, yeah, you, right. <laughs> but I, I didn't. I didn't imagine you could have this percentages of support of uh, of something of a longer strike from a, a member of the military. I mean, it's it's pretty. Uh, no, it's great news. It's it's uh, it's an interesting uh, uh, notion to see. So now Biden came up yesterday with a strong word about uh, uh, if uh, Netanyahu doesn't change his politics, he's gonna do something about not helping anymore. What? How do you? How do you see it? Right. Um, I mean, I, I think that was um, obviously due to the the strike on the aid workers. Yes on the humanitarian workers yeah right um but it's I, I do find it kind of ridiculous that um you know that seven uh or seven or six i can't remember how many but um international civilians have to die for for him to care or for others to care but you know we have thirty thousand plus thirty thousand palestinian that's Palestinian right. civilians dead and not not a single care, just unconditional support. And even after, um, you know, his his talk with Netanyahu, he he still supported him uh, um, unconditionally. He I think he just said, um, you know, he would change his stance uh, on their relations if you know were, things were to continue uh, becoming or getting worse but i think um i think ultimately that's just for the the public to be reassured and, and not something he genuinely means and he's running for election too i mean it's you know it, yeah it, I, mean, I don't think he cares too much no? if we're talking my personal opinion i don't think he cares too much about winning the election he's already uh he's already pretty old so or the oldest president ever uh, so I think his goal is to probably um, help the the state of Israel as much as he can before he gets out of office. Do you want to do a statement? Do you have a statement you want to make now? I mean, do you want to something very specific you want to say? Because I have an, one more question before I let you go. Um, a statement? Um yeah, just that my my views, my opinions are my own and, and not a reflection of the military. Okay, no, no. So the last question, and I'll, I'll let you go. Um, what is the percentages or how do you see the relation between the military as a government organization and the corporation who are uh, uh, producing the, the weapon and, and all of this? And do you think the government still have control of the military? Do I think the government has control of the military? Well, I mean, at, at the at the large, at the large entity of uh, if you see the involvement of the U.S. in Ukraine, if you see the bases, if you see the weapon who have been sold all over the world, do you think the the corporation have, have are taking control of the military, or how do you see the relationship? Because I mean, the 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 story in Israel is we send the weapons, we finance this war. We 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 are the one who are doing the is no is very few military who are engaged on that war. And in Ukraine it's right. the same situation. So how do you what is your take? Yeah, um I mean prior to October 7th, I wasn't really paying attention to where you know our cargo was going. You know, after obviously, that's when I I really started like trying to see because you know what what's specifically going to Israel is is being used mostly on civilians, and that was that was really um, difficult to see in person. Uh, you know, the the munitions that I knew full heartedly were going to be used on civilians, but um, as far as like Ukraine or other places or um, you know, I, I don't know too much about okay. that, so. No. But uh, but yeah, I, I think ultimately, as far as like the control of, of the military or the discretion of the military, that's all a reflection of, um, you know, the, the president uh, who was the commander in chief 
and the um and the secretary of defense and yeah. it just trickled down uh from there from trickle down good luck i hope we're going to be able to talk um uh, and and you know if anything we can do in support let us know if you uh, make need to make a call let us know we will we will be here behind you and and good okay. luck today okay Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you so much. I I, I see him being into the on the street doing this this stand and and but I think we also need a larger vision of of what are we looking at and and how can we understand uh, the relationship between Israel, Ukraine, and and the thousand of bases all all around the world. Um, so yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, if I have it right, your question was, uh, does the government have control of the military or what's the role of the corporations in there? Yeah, and, that's right. Uh, I, I, my view personally, um, and I think I speak for a good number of uh, Veterans for Peace members, uh, is that the corporations have control of the entire government. The entire government. The Health insurance companies have control of uh, health care policy. The highway lobby has control of the transportation policy. The Raytheon and Boeing and the uh, weapons producers have control of our foreign policy. And that has been the case for some time. And uh, I call the people who are running the government madmen arsonists because they operate globally setting fires all over and they, uh, their, the corporations have their puppets in the government who do as, their, as the system dictates. You know, we have a system that is uh, controlled by uh, some extremely powerful, wealthy elites who have their own interests, and they want those interests to be taken care of. And you don't get into high places in government in this country without agreeing to take care of those interests. And so that's how the whole thing runs. And it's to the benefit, uh, you know, a Marine Corps General Smedley Butler about almost a hundred years ago said, war is a racket. It benefits the few at the expense of the many. And that's the way it's always been through history. And what we're seeing now is that the corporations have such a lock on uh, our government uh, across the board, but in our case here, particularly with the military and with foreign policy. And so uh, the policy that is being carried out in regards to Israel, in regards to Ukraine, is driven by the corporations that are making billions and billions of dollars at this. And they take a small amount of that money that they get from the taxpayers. They take a very small amount of that money and invest it in the politicians so that this arrangement continues. You know, and Larry mentioned uh, he thought Biden isn't too particularly concerned because, you know, of his age and uh, he's probably not going to get reelected. Uh, who knows if he's going to get reelected or not? But I know darn well that, like with any politician, the first thing and the second thing and the third thing they care it's about money. <laughs> money, because that helps them stay in. Power. That's it. They want to stay in power. That's right. So uh, that's you know another another view on that. Well, question. we have a yes, and we have a very different way to see war in 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 the past ten years than we had before. Like Vietnam, we send. We send military to Vietnam. We send military to Indochine. We send military to places, to Afghanistan, to where now we don't even send the military anymore. We just sell the weapons and we make sure we find middlemen to do the job over there. So and we're not even we're not even subtle about it. Our politicians come out and say we will trade Ukrainian blood for our money it's really uh, and in the u.s congress it's like 90 percent of the of the u.s congress are supporting the the so-called help to to uh, ukraine and israel yeah so yeah. Um, so but that's a very different way of going about wars uh because even before that in middle Ages, war was uh, in in remote 
places with two military attacking to one another, the civilians have nothing to do with that wars. And I mean, most of the time. Where now, uh, it's the civilian and 90% who get, who get affected and the military uh, uh, drone and, and weapons from the sky or from uh, whatever. So how do we how do we go about it? Jackie, I don't want to take all the I time. mean, what I hear, um, I mean, I just wrote this because after listening to Larry, in essence, we're all on our own. Um, it has to be from people. It has to be from the from a majority. The, um, the leadership is non-existent. There's no morality. There's no. That's why moral injury. When when Mac Bika brought up moral injury to me, there was a clarion call in my head, knowing my cousin in World War II um, and his inability to express something. It wasn't PTSD. It wasn't a psychological thing. It was more of something inside him. And um, so to me, it, it's a moral ethical issue that, that seems to be, uh, I heard last night that Jill Biden, uh, and I think it's in the media today or something, she, she, her quote was, make it stop to him, to her husband. Um, it was not uh, the independent, and I think it was in the New York Times as well, um, this article. So maybe the, you know, on, a, on some level of the invisible, I'll call it the invisible, there's something that's amiss. <laughs> it, it, and uh, what we don't see, but what we feel and we know in our hearts, I know it sounds like the bleeding heart of the 60s, <laughs> um, but that's the 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 basis is we we know um, that that there's something drastically wrong when people pretend that this is not not happening or you hear something to the contrary. It's a moral issue, a and I think the our leaders have failed in taking that stance because of their own their own fears, their own um, desire for power, but that will eat them alive it, as it's eating everybody alive. <laughs> you know, the, the victims, they become victims as well. When you don't take a moral stance, that's the problem. And and it if it doesn't affect you currently, uh, they say um, silence is consent, chi tace consente in Italian. Whoever keeps their mouth shut, means that they agree and and that doesn't sit well with your moral compass so if you're destroying your moral compass where do you go from here and and i don't think the you know what larry said is probably has some truth to it but the alternative <laughs> i wouldn't choose the alternative either either of the alternatives that that are speaking now there is no leadership, period. We, we are the people that we're waiting for. Exactly. Yes, we are. Yeah. That's it. That's right. So thank you so much for your both. So um, Jackie is a correspondent for Presenza in Long Island. She's a peace organizer uh, in Long Island who has been doing a very interesting panel discussion. And she worked on the internees uh, during World War II. Um, and we're going to do a, another presentation later on about the, the documentary who has been made. And, uh, and Mike is with uh, uh, is the National Director for Veteran for Peace. Thank you to you both. Uh, it was a very, very, very interesting interview today. Thank you.